Hello, I'm Dennis Morris. I'm a mathematician and a theoretical physicist. In this video, I'm going to talk of quaternions. Quaternions? I have never heard of them, I hear you say. Was it a rank in the Roman army? No, it wasn't a rank in the Roman army. And by the time you finish this video, I can assure you, you will have heard of quaternions. I assume that you are familiar with the real numbers, and I assume that you, that you are familiar with the Euclidean complex two-dimensional numbers, which we normally simply call the complex numbers. In order that I can be sure that you know that of which I speak, I have a picture of a two-dimensional Euclidean complex number. I have placed a little hat, a carrot, over the eye. This is unusual, but it is useful in this video. I have introduced the matrix notation for the complex numbers. We will be using matrix notation throughout this video. I hope you like matrix notation because matrix notation is best. I've included the polar form of the complex numbers. Notice the rotation matrix. We see that i is a square root of minus 1. Please be aware that any square matrix with the same variable on the leading diagonal and zeros everywhere else is equivalent to a real number. Quaternions are a type of four-dimensional complex number. I have a picture of a quaternion for you. The traditional notation includes three square roots of minus one, written as i, j and k. Again, I have put little hats on these objects. There are two types of quaternion, which we call left chiral quaternions, and right chiral quaternions. Unfortunately, the traditional notation does not distinguish between the two types of quaternion. I told you matrix notation was best. There is not a Roman soldier in sight. The real numbers have been known since God was a young boy. The two-dimensional complex numbers were discovered by Gerolamo Cardano and published in his book Ars Magna in 1545. The quaternions were discovered by William Rowan Hamilton in 1843. Historically, the two-dimensional complex numbers have been seen as an extension of the real numbers. They were seen as the real numbers with an extra axis. Following Cardano's discovery, mathematicians began to search for three-dimensional types of numbers. They assumed that a three-dimensional complex number would be an extension of the two-dimensional complex numbers, and so they began with the two-dimensional complex numbers and tried to add an extra axis. They failed. We now know that the three-dimensional complex numbers are not an extension of the two-dimensional complex numbers, and so we understand why they failed. It's possible to think of the quaternions as an extension of the two-dimensional complex numbers. But that's really barking up the wrong tree. In fact, it's running round the wrong forest. Before we can properly deduce the quaternions, we need to properly deduce the two-dimensional complex numbers. The two-dimensional Euclidean complex numbers derive from the order 4 cyclic finite group C4. 
we need to know a little more about finite group. A finite group is nothing more than a closed set of permutations. We write these permutations as permutation matrices. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between permutations and permutation matrices. Note that in some cases we can use minus signs within the set of permutation matrices. We choose a finite group. Here we have cho chosen the order 2 cyclic finite group C2. We multiply each permutation matrix in the group by a real variable. We add these matrices. We call the matrix so form the algebraic matrix form of the particular finite group. We then take the exponential of this algebraic matrix form. In the case of the order 2 finite group C2, we have arrived at the two dimensional hyperbolic complex numbers, first discovered by James Cockle in 1848. This is two dimensional space time, it is the space of special relativity. A rotation in this space is a change of velocity. The determinant of the algebraic matrix form is the distance function of the space. This is also the norm of the algebra. The hyperbolic complex numbers are not as well known as they deserve to be, but they are not our concern here. We have the idea. We begin with a finite group written as a set of permutation matrices. We multiply each permutation matrix by a real number. We add these matrices, that forms the algebraic matrix form. We then take the exponential of the algebraic matrix form and out pops a space, a kind of number, the polar form of a type of complex numbers. Most groups have several algebraic matrix forms, but they are all equivalent. We'll do it again. We'll do it with the finite group C4. Here we have used a 2x2 two two representation of the order 4 cyclic group C4. We can write some finite groups, but not all finite groups, as permutation matrices of half the size of the group order, if we use minus signs within the matrices as we have done here. We have derived the two-dimensional Euclidean complex numbers from the finite group C4. Although we saw this earlier, I'll go through it again. We see that the variable on the leading diagonal is the real part of the complex number, and the other variable is the imaginary part of the complex number. We see that we have a square root of minus 1. We also have the polar form of the two-dimensional Euclidean complex numbers. Easy peasy. You note that we have not extended the real numbers to get the complex numbers. We've simply started with a finite group. Here's another way to do it. Here we have simply sought to find all 2x2 two two matrices whose form is maintained by matrix multiplication. We can set the parameter to any real value other than 0, but setting it to plus or minus 1 is easiest. We now have all possible types of two dimensional complex numbers. When we consider the derivation of the two-dimensional complex numbers, there is a great deal of talk about algebraic extensions based on monic minimum polynomials that cannot be factored into linear factors over the algebraic field concerned. We don't need any of that. All we need is a finite group.
at some time in your mathematical education, you might have wondered why do we have such a weird multiplication operation within the two-dimensional complex numbers? Why the complicated multiplication operation at the top? We might have expected something more straightforward, such as is shown at the bottom. Complex number multiplication is just matrix multiplication. What actually is matrix multiplication? We have seen that the variables within the complex numbers, both the hyperbolic type and the Euclidean type, are really just permutations multiplied by a real variable. Within a number system like the complex numbers, matrix multiplication is no more than the sequential combining of permutations to produce another permutation. Addition is adding the same permutation to itself. I know you want to see a three dimensional complex number. There are four types of three dimensional complex number, but this video is about quaternions. However, I'm going to show you one type of three dimensional complex number. We have taken the order three cyclic finite group C3, written as three permutation matrices. We have multiplied each permutation matrix by a real variable. We have added these matrices to form the algebraic matrix form of the finite group C3. We then just took the exponential of the algebraic matrix form. The matrix on the right is a three-dimensional rotation matrix, and the functions in this three-dimensional rotation matrix are three-dimensional trigonometric functions. Notice this, the angle in this three-dimensional space is formed from two variables. When we meet the quaternions, we're going to meet quaternion rotation. Quaternion rotation is a rotation matrix that is a 4x4 four four matrix. Inside that 4x4 four four quaternion rotation matrix, we have four-dimensional quaternion trigonometric functions. And the argument of those four-dimensional trigonometric functions is a four-dimensional angle. A four-dimensional angle is comprised of three variables. We are not going to look at the three-dimensional complex numbers in this video, but I wanted to prepare you for the quaternion rotation and for quaternion angles in quaternion space. going to derive the quaternions from the order 4 direct product finite group known as C2 cross C2. This group is also known as the Klein group. We begin with the four permutation matrices that form the finite group C2 cross C2. We multiply each permutation matrix by a real variable and add them to form an algebraic matrix form of the group. This is the basic algebraic matrix form of the order 4 finite group C2 cross C2. This finite group has only one algebraic matrix form because the order 24 finite symmetric group of 4x4 permutation matrices S4 as only one C2 cross C2 subgroup. I'll let you into a little secret here. A quick way of calculating the algebraic matrix form of a group 
is simply to take the Cayley table of that group with all the identities on the leading diagonal and copy it. We are now going to derive all the algebras that are derivable from the finite group C2 cross C2. We're going to do that by looking for all the 4x4 four four matrices that are of closed matrix form under matrix multiplication. Now some of these matrices are associated with the finite group C4. We have no interest in the finite group C4 or those algebras in this video. In this video we are interested only in the 4x4 four four matrices which are of algebraically closed form under matrix multiplication and are associated with the finite group C2 cross C2. This is just a scaled up version of what we did with the 2x2 two two matrices when we derived every 2x2 two two matrix which is of closed form. We begin by placing real parameters on each element that is not on the leading diagonal and not on the top row. We have two such matrices with different variables. We will eliminate some of these parameters by insisting on multiplicative closure of matrix form. By insisting upon multiplicative closure of form, we are able to eliminate five of the parameters using linear equations. However, we need to eliminate one more parameter to get multiplicative closure of form. Now something surprising happens. We cannot eliminate any more parameters using linear parameter elimination equations. We need to eliminate one more parameter. We are driven to use a quadratic parameter elimination equation. Now, linear equations have only one solution, but a quadratic equation has two solutions. This means that the finite group C2 cross C2 leads to two algebraic matrix forms. One corresponds to the positive root of the quadratic equation and the other to the negative root of the quadratic equation. The difference between the two algebraic matrix forms is just four minus signs. We see that the two solutions give us two similar but different algebraic matrix forms of the group C2 cross C2. This is utterly remarkable. It seems as if an extra algebraic matrix form has emerged from thin air. Something truly remarkable has happened here. One of these algebraic matrix forms contains non-commutative algebras. Non-commutative algebras have popped out of the commutative group C2 cross C2. Let me emphasize that. Some of the algebras that come out of the commutative group C2 cross C2 are non-commutative algebras. There are three parameters in each of these algebraic matrix forms. Setting these parameters to either plus one or minus one gives eight algebras in each algebraic matrix form. We have here 16 separate algebras. Within a commutative group, we get the same product variable regardless of the order in which we multiply together the two factor variables. If a non-commutative algebra is going to derive from a commutative group, then the non-commutivity of that algebra must be in the sign of the variable in the product. It cannot be in the actual variable in the product. Let me emphasize that again. A non-commutative algebra that derives from a commutative group 
has its non-commutivity in the sign, not in the variable. Non-commutativity means that if you multiply two variables together in opposite order, CB rather than BC, then you get a different product. Above, the difference is in the sign of the product. Non-commutativity is a central property of quaternions. There is a different kind of non-commutativity, wherein the differently ordered products are a different variable, rather than just a different sign. We will now return to the algebras that derive from the finite group of order 4, C2 cross C2. The complete set of algebras is two commutative A1 algebras, which are algebraically isomorphic, six commutative A2 algebras, which are algebraically isomorphic, two non-commutative quaternion algebras, and six non-commutative A3 algebras. Recall that the two dimensional Euclidean complex numbers are associated with the finite group C4, an order 4 group. These algebras are associated with the order 8 groups. We have included a type of algebra from the order 4 cyclic finite group C4, which is associated with the order 8 finite cyclic group C8. We see that every order 8 group has emerged from the order 4 finite groups. This phenomenon is not clearly understood. In this video, we have no interest in the A1 or the A2 algebras. They are both commutative, they do not interest us. Nor are we interested in the non-commutative A3 algebras. In this video, our interest is in the two quaternion algebras. We have two quaternion algebras. Under the algebraic operations of addition and multiplication, these two algebras are algebraically isomorphic. But the quaternions are non commutative. These two algebras have different commutation relations. They are different algebras. Within the quaternion matrices, the B variable is the I variable, the C variable is the imaginary J variable, and the D variable is the imaginary K variable. We see that the commutation relations of the right chiral quaternions are in the opposite direction to the commutation relations of the left chiral quaternion. One day you might hear about Lie algebra. The quaternions are isomorphic as a Lie algebra to the Lie algebra SU2. SU2 is very prominent in particle physics. However, here we have two quaternion algebras. We have a left-handed SU2 and we have a right-handed SU2. If you don't know anything about Lie algebra, you don't need to know anything about Lie algebra to understand quaternions. That was just an aside. The 
non-commutative algebras which emerge from the non-commutative groups like the order 6 asymmetric group S3 are non-commutative in that the multiplication of two variables in opposite orders gives two different variables as the two products. The non-commutative algebras which emerge from the commutative groups like the order 4 direct product group C2 cross C2 are non-commutative in that multiplication by two variables in opposite orders gives two products that are the same variable but with different signs. In the S3 algebras BC equals D but CB equals E. In the quaternions BC equals plus D and CB equals minus D. To reiterate, the only way a commutative group can hold a non-commutative algebra is if the non-commutivity of the algebra is in the sign, not the variable. This property of the non-commutative algebras that derive from a commutative group leads to a third algebraic operation. As well as addition and multiplication, we ha now have a third algebraic operation. A standard mantra of ab abstract algebra is that there are two and only two algebraic operations. These are addition and multiplication. We have seen above that the complex numbers and the quaternions and algebras in general derive from finite groups. Finite groups are just closed sets of permutations. An algebraic operation is a way of combining two permutations together and getting a permutation. The addition operation combines two copies of the same permutation adds them together and gets another copy of that permutation. The multiplication operation sequentially combines two permutations together. An algebraic operation is nothing more than a way of combining permutations together that produces a permutation. It might seem that there are only two ways of combining two permutations together to get another permutation. But in some of the algebras that derive from a finite group that is commutative, but the algebra is non-commutative, we have a third operation, a third way of combining two permutations together to get a permutation. We have a third algebraic operation. This third algebraic operation is called the commutator. Perhaps one of the most important things about the quaternions is that they show the existence of this third algebraic operation, which we call the commutator. Within a non-commutative algebra derived from a commutative finite group, the commutator operation combines the two permutations and produces a permutation. We also have the anti-commutation. If we take the two left chiral quaternion variables as matrices, we see that the commutator of these two permutations is a permutation. The commutator is an algebraic operation within the quaternion algebras. The commutator operation is meaningless within a commutative algebra. The anti-commutator operation is just normal multiplication within a commutative algebra. The commutator operation does not exist within a non-commutative algebra that derives from a non-commutative group. The anti-commutator similarly does not exist in a non-commutative algebra that derives from a non-commutative group. Only in non-commutative algebras that derive from commutative groups do we have this third algebraic operation which is the commutator and the anti-commutator. I need to clarify something here. 
although it is true that if the commutator exists within an algebra, then that algebra must be a non-commutative algebra that is derived from a commutative finite group, it is not true that every non-commutative algebra that derives from a commutative group holds the commutator operation. For example, the algebras that derive from the commutative finite group C2 cross C2 cross C2, an order 8 group, are, all hold the commutator. The algebras that derive from the order 16 finite group C2 cross C2 cross C2 cross C2 do not support the commutator operation. This has profound consequences for the Fermian content of the universe. Within the quaternions, we have addition, we have multiplication, and we have the commutator operation. Three algebraic operations. The existence of this third algebraic operation implies the existence of a different type of differentiation. We call this non-commutative differentiation, and we will look at it later. We have now come to the end of this first video in this series of videos about quaternions. We will continue in the next video. But before we do that, please allow me to advertise some of the books that I have written. Thank you for your attention.